Ah, oh, g'day, mate. Luke Ford here. I'm having a little difficulty sleeping tonight, so I just thought I'd uh, read a book out loud with you. And the book that I'm reading is called Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. It's a book by Chaim Maccabee. He was a uh, Jewish historian and uh, Bible scholar, and uh, he lived in England. So he was born in 1924. He died in 2004. He was a British Jewish scholar and a dramatist specializing in the study of the Jewish and Christian religious tradition. His uh, grandfather was Rabbi Chaim Maccabee, better known as the Kamenitz of Margaret, a passionate religious Zionist and advocate of vegetarianism and animal welfare. Chaim Maccabee uh, was a librarian at Leo Beck College in London. In retirement, he moved to Leeds, where he held an academic position at the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Leeds. He was known for his theories of the historical Jesus and the historical origins of Christianity. He wrote extensively on the phenomenon of ancient and modern anti-Semitism. He considered the gospel traditions blaming the Jews for the death of Jesus, and especially the legend of Judas Iscariot which he believed to be a product of the Gentile Pauline church as the roots of Christian anti-Semitism. And he also wrote a lot about the Talmud and the history of Judaism. So looking at Wikipedia here, I'll add this to the video description. All right, so I started reading him when I was uh, converting to Judaism. Hayam Maccabee considered the portrayal of Jesus given in the canonical gospels and the history of Jesus Christ. That was an earthquake. Whoa, maybe God's sending me a message. I am Maccabee considered the portrayal of Jesus given in the canonical gospels and the history of the early church from the book of Acts to be heavily distorted and full of later myth mythical traditions, but claimed that a fairly accurate historical account of the life of Jesus could be reconstructed from them nevertheless. Maccabee argued that the real Jesus was not a rebel against the Jewish law, but was instead a Jewish messianic claimant whose life and teachings were within the mainstream of first century Judaism. Haimakabee believed that Jesus was executed as a rebel against the Roman occupation of Judea. However, he did not claim that Jesus was the leader of an actual armed rebellion. Rather, Jesus and his followers inspired by the Tanakh, meaning the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. We're expecting a supernatural divine intervention that would end the Roman rule, restore the Davidic kingdom with Jesus as the divinely anointed monarch and inaugurate the messianic age of peace and prosperity for the whole world. These expectations were not fulfilled and Jesus was arrested and executed by the Romans. And so according to Haya Maccabee, Barabbas from the Aramaic Bar Abba, son of the father, originally referred to Jesus himself, who was called thus from his custom of addressing the father as Abba, father in his prayers. Many of the disciples of Jesus did not lose their hopes, believing that Jesus would soon be miraculously resurrected by God and continued to live in expectation of his second coming. Their fellowship continued to exist in Jerusalem as a strictly Orthodox Jewish sect under the leadership of James the Just. They had no notion that uh, Jesus was God and that uh, belief in Jesus would bring salvation. Uh, they lived completely within Orthodox Judaism. Now, according to Hayat Maccabee, the founding of Christianity as a religion separate from Judaism was entirely the work of Paul of Tarsus in Maccabee's view, uh, this Maccabee's view is largely based on the work of Heinrich Graetz. So according to Haim Maccabee, Paul was a Hellenized Jewish convert or perhaps even a, a non-Jew coming from a background exposed to the influence of Gnosticism and the pagan mystery religions such as the Attis cult. 
a myth involving a life, death, rebirth deity. These Hellenic mystery religions, according to Maccabee, were the dominant religious forms in the Hellenistic world of that age, so would have strongly influenced Paul's mythological psychology. And Maccabee partly derives this theory from fragments of the writings of the opponents of the Ebionites. Maccabee considers Paul's claims to be an orthodox Pharisaic Jewish education to be false, asserting that while many of Paul's writings sound authentic to the uninitiated, they actually betray in ignorance the original Hebrew scripture and the subtleties of Jewish law. Maccabee claims that an examination of the New Testament indicates that Paul knew no Hebrew at all, relied entirely on Greek texts, and that no actual Pharisee would ever use these texts because they were not properly translated from the Hebrew originals. So, according to Higher Maccabee, Paul fused the historical of Jesus' story of Jesus' crucifixions with elements of contemporary mystery religions and Gnosticism, developing such non-Judaic mythic ideas as the Trinity and the Last Supper. Paul made an attempt to find justification for this newly created myth in the Old Testament. Paul came to present Jesus as a dying and rising savior deity similar to those from the Hellenistic mystery cults, fused with the historical pedigree of Judaism, thus giving birth to a powerful new myth whose preaching gained him a large following. As the Jerusalem group, the original disciples of Jesus gradually became aware of Paul's teachings, bitter hostility ensued between them. So no one who actually knew the historical Jesus uh, uh, had the ideas that Paul did, that that Jesus was, was God come to earth. It was only Paul who never met the historical Jesus who came up with these ideas, according to uh, Haya Maccabee. And so you'll find a lot of uh, videos on YouTube about uh, Paul being the the real founder of Christianity. So that's, I'd say, probably the dominant non-Christian view of the origins of Christianity, that it was Paul who developed the essential doctrines of Christianity, that Jesus was God, that uh, Jesus was sent to earth to save humanity from sin. Okay, so just going to check out the, the chat. Yeah, Paul was a Gnostic, nasty boy. Yeah, it's a very odd streaming time, but I couldn't sleep, so I was just thinking about this book that I I read, wow, about 1992. So I just found it online. Okay. Hi, Maccabee writes in his book, Revelation in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. There are certain advantages, he writes, in being Jewish when attempting to understand the Gospels, especially if one had been brought up in close contact with the Jewish liturgy, the ceremonials of the Jewish religious year, the rabbinical literature, and the general Jewish moral and cultural outlook. Many aspects of the Gospels, which for the non-Jew matters are for scholarly inquiry, are for the Jew as familiar as the air he breathes. Okay, going to fight off dry mouth with biotin moisturizing spray. When Jesus drank wine and broke bread at the Last Supper, he was doing what a Jew does every time he performs a Kiddush ceremony before a festival or Sabbath meal. When Jesus began his prayer with our Father, who art in heaven, he was following the pattern of Pharisaic prayers, which still form part of the Jewish daily prayer book. When he spoke in parables and used startling phrases such as swallow a camel or the beam in thine own eye, he was using methods of expression familiar to any student of the Talmudic writings. At the same time, a Jew reading the Gospels is immediately aware of aspects which do not seem authentic. For example, the accounts of the Pharisees wanting to kill Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath. Pharisees never included healing in their list of activities forbidden on the Sabbath, 
and Jesus's methods of healing did not involve any of the activities that were forbidden. It is unlikely, therefore, that they would have disapproved even mildly of Jesus's Sabbath healing. Moreover, the picture of bloodthirsty, murderous Pharisees given in the Gospels contradicts everything known about them from Josephus, from their own writings, and from the Judaism still living today, which they created. So reading this book uh, helped my my blogging, my journalism, my, my approach to life through the years in that uh, I, I learned about how to go against the tendency. So when you're dealing with an ideological work or an ideological presentation, you look for the facts in the work or the presentation that go against the ideological tendency of the work, and these are the ones most likely to be factually true. So here we have a contradiction in the Gospels between those passages which seem authentic and those which do not. To a Jew studying the Gospels, a contradiction is manifest, and he wants to know how it arose. And the issue widens as he considers the religion based upon the Gospels, Christianity itself, with its curious mixture of Jewish, non-Jewish, and anti-Jewish elements. How does it come about that a religion which borrows so heavily from Judaism has, for the major part of its history, regarded the Jews as pariahs and outcasts? In a civilization based on the Hebrew scriptures, a civilization whose languages are permeated with Hebrew idioms, the Jews have been treated with extraordinary hate, culminating in the Holocaust of six million European Jews during the Second World War. The study of Jesus, with the emphasis on his Jewish background, with the kind of approach that comes most naturally from a Jew, they throw some light on these questions, which are of importance to both Jews and Gentiles. Okay, I'm checking out uh, the, the chat. So the time in California right now is 1.45 a.m. I wasn't sleeping, so I gave a talk this evening and so that, that usually amps me up. And so it's harder to sleep. Okay. How do I like my lasagna? Oh, I had some awesome lasagna on Sunday. It was delish. I'm vegetarian, so just uh, lots of cheese and pasta. So good. Definitely no, no meat. Yeah, too much alkaline water St stops my ability to to sleep. Okay. All right, let's go back to this book. The Problem of Barabbas, Chapter 1. The story of Barabbas makes an excellent introduction to the problems posed by the Gospels. In this episode, all the dramatic personae came, come together as in a focal crowd scene of a play. Romans are represented by Pilate, a rare appearance this, for in general the Romans are surprisingly unobtrusive in the Gospels. All the Jewish groups are represented, the high priest with his Sadducean followers, the Pharisees, the revolutionary zealots, the Herodians, and the Jewish masses all shown united in their hatred of Jesus. If we could really understand the Barabbas episode, we would understand the Gospels as a whole. For this episode contains in miniature not only the elements that go to make the Gospel story, but also the Gospel orientation and attitude toward the life and death of Jesus. Let us recall the story pieced together from all four Gospels. Jesus has been captured and handed over to Pilate. In the same prison where Jesus is lying, there is another prisoner called Barabbas, a rebel or bandit. The time is the Passover festival, and at this time, the Jewish crowd of Jerusalem has the right to demand the release of one prisoner, Pilate. The Roman governor has been favorably impressed by the personality of Jesus and is also convinced of Jesus' innocence of the charges against him. The crowd begin to shout for the customary release of a prisoner. Pilate seizes the opportunity to offer to release Jesus the king of the Jews. But the Jewish priests have been moving among the crowd, persuading them to not accept this offer. 
The crowd accept the priest's persuasion and refuse Pilate's offer to release Jesus. Instead, they shout for the release of Barabbas, the man of violence. Pilate, sorrowfully realizing that he will have to comply, asks what he should do with Jesus. Crucify him, crucify him, shout the crowd. Pilate is horrified by this bloodthirsty request, which he also cannot refuse. However, he wishes to absolve himself from guilt in the matter, so he publicly washes his hands in token of his innocence. Jewish crowd, on the other hand, insist on their own responsibility, calling a curse on their own heads and on the heads of their children. And so Barabbas is released and Jesus is led away to be crucified. Who here is in the Judean People's Front and who is in the People's Front of Judea? <laughs> okay. Certain questions present themselves at once. Why, after all, did Pilate have to crucify Jesus? If the Jews had the right to release the prisoner of their choice, that did not give them the right to dictate to the governor what penalty he should inflict on other prisoners who were not released. One of the Gospels, that of John, gives an answer to this question. The Jews blackmailed Pilate by threatening to report him to Caesar if he did not execute Jesus. For whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. But why should Pilate have to be reminded of this, especially by the Jews who are not remarkable for their subservience to Roman power? Why is Pilate, the Roman governor, oblivious of the fact that a claim to be king of the Jews amounted to sedition against Rome? So oblivious is he of this that he actually endorses Jesus' kingship, presenting him to the people with the words, Behold your king, and asking the crowd, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? These questions are puzzling enough, but even more perplexing questions arise when we consider the events leading up to the Brabus incident. Only a few days earlier, Jesus had entered Jerusalem to huge popular acclaim. His triumphal entry, as it is called, is described in all the Gospels as an event of national importance. The people hailed him as the son of David and also as a prophet. As Jesus rode by on an ass's fall, the crowd greeted him enthusiastically by waving palm branches and spreading their cloaks in the road before him. Then came the cleansing of the temple. Jesus entered the temple and in defiance of the temple police, overturned the table of the money changers and traders and drove them out of the temple grounds with a whip. He was able to do this, say the gospels, because the authorities were cowed by Jesus' strong popular support. According to the Gospel of Matthew, they were afraid of the people who looked on Jesus as a prophet. Jesus' triumphal entry, according to the Gospel accounts, was on Sunday. On Thursday night, he was arrested. On Friday, he was dead. And the Barabbas story describes how the final word lay with the Jewish masses, the Jerusalem crowd. They called eagerly for Jesus' death and insisted that he should die by one of the cruelest punishments known to man. The crucial question posed by the Barabbas story then is, why did a crowd that acclaimed Jesus as a hero on Sunday howl for his blood on Friday? The explanation most commonly given is the crowd were disappointed in Jesus. They had great hopes that he was the promised Messiah who would defeat the Romans and restore Jewish independence. Instead, he'd been easily overcome and had accepted his defeat and arrest with passive meekness and silence. Barabbas, on the other hand, was a man of violence. He too had been overcome and arrested, but no doubt he had shown great qualities of violent resistance, which had endeared him to the crowd. Consequently, with the fickleness of crowds, they switched their allegiance to Barabbas. Their previous enthusiastic love for Jesus turned to hatred and contempt. In this mood, they were easily persuaded by the high priests and elders to demand Jesus' death. This is, no doubt, the impression that the story is intended to convey. That Jesus stands for a lofty pacifism, while Barabbas stands for the materialism of violence. The unspiritual crowd do not understand that Jesus is not the grossly successful Messiah whom they had been expecting. His kingdom is not 
of this world. He is the Son of God who must suffer defeat and death in order to atone for the sins of mankind. The choice of Barabbas was the choice of this world and a rejection of the kingdom of the Spirit. Yeah, breathe right nasal strips. Well, you guys should see what happened to the other guy. However, the difficulties of the crowd's change of attitude remain. Jesus had entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in the style of a monarch and had accepted without demur kind of welcome reserve for a claimant to the throne. His action in expelling the money changers from the temple certainly showed no pacifism or general principle against violent action. He had issued swords to his disciples, so we're talking Luke, uh, I think, chapter 22, verse 38. There had been some resistance at the time of his arrest. The Jewish populace had no reason to suppose that Jesus was a pacifist. His intention to endure a crucifixion without struggle had been confided only to his closest intimates, and even they did not quite believe it. The crowd, who knew of Jesus' miracle cures, would not despair of his eventual success just because he had been arrested. They would be waiting expectantly for some miracle on his part, such as the crumbling of the walls of his prison. Such a miracle would be part of their picture of the Messiah. That Jesus disdained the support of a regular army, that he was silent for the most part to the charges made against him, would have argued his quiet confidence in supernatural support on which he would surely call when the time was ripe. When the Roman governor came forward, obviously impressed and awed by Jesus and offered to release him, this would have been regarded by the crowd as the very miracle for which they had been waiting. Roman governors were not usually disposed to favor a pretender to the throne, one moreover who had entered Jerusalem with a high hand in the style of a conqueror. Clearly, God had made the Roman governor mad to destroy him. Instead of seeing Pilate's offer as the confirmation of their hopes in Jesus, the crowd turned against him and with extraordinary spite called for his death. Popularity is liable to wane and crowds are notoriously fickle. But such fickleness would ordinarily lead to neglect or to active persecution. One could understand the crowd for getting Jesus if a glamorous new hero came along. Barabbas, as it happens, was no more successful than Jesus. He too had been arrested and put in prison. It is not as if Barabbas was Jesus' enemy, so that support for Barabbas necessarily implied antagonism for Jesus. Both men lay in the prison of the Roman governor for what must have seemed to the crowd very similar reasons. Both had become objects of suspicion to the occupying authorities because of their popularity among the native population who were becoming restive with hopes of liberation from Roman rule. Situation was not at all like that of the fickle Roman crowd depicted in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, switching their allegiance from Pompey to Caesar, from Caesar to Brutus, and then from Brutus to Antony. All these switches were from one leader to his deadly enemy. The analogy often drawn between this Roman crowd and the Jewish crowd depicted in the Gospels is false. The Jewish crowd is not just fickle, it is inexplicably treacherous and malicious. It shows a motiveless hatred which clearly serves some purpose of the narrator, but has no probable basis in reality. Yes, I uh, woke up, tossed and turned, said, heck, I want to read this book. should be noted that only the latest account, that of the Gospel of John, describes Barabbas as a bandit. The earlier three accounts describe him as a rebel. Evidently, John wishes to emphasize the senseless malice of the Jews even more by representing them as preferring a mere robber to Jesus. The words robber and bandit have been used throughout history to denigrate freedom fighters. The Greek word for bandit is frequently used to describe the Jewish freedom fighters by those who are unsympathetic to them. Even actual bandits never gain popular esteem unless they have some social aims. 
the very least, a propensity to rub the rich and to help the poor. In John's account, the Jews favored Barabbas just because he was a bandit. They are left without any excuse for their choice. The historical use to which the story of Barabbas was put is plain enough. It was used time and again as a weapon against the Jews, as proof that responsibility for the death of Jesus lay not with the minority of priests or elders, but with the whole Jewish people. It was vital to the Christian church to establish itself as the true Israel, to prove that the Jews had forfeited their position as the people of God, by their betrayal of Jesus, and that all the Old Testament promises now applied not to the Jews, but to the Christian church. This story, then, was of the greatest importance, for it showed the Jews rejecting Jesus and taking upon themselves the responsibility for his crucifixion. The cry of the Jewish crowd, crucify him, crucify him, was the basis of the Christian treatment of the Jews as a guilty nation. Was this the purpose of the Barabbas story itself, or was this just an interpretation put on it by the Christian church? Is the Barabbas incident simply an invention inserted into the record to discredit the Jews and saddle them with the corporate responsibility for Jesus' death? If so, how did the story develop? Surely there must have been some kernel of truth, however many distortions it may have subsequently have undergone. How can we account for the crowd seen outside Pilate's residence, the calling of the crowd for the release of a prisoner, the name Barabbas itself? Even if we reject the story as the literal truth, we must give some explanation of it as an element in the Gospels. Another difficulty in the Barabbas story, just as puzzling as the contradictory and malicious behavior of the crowd, is the part played by the Roman governor Pilate. Unlike Barabbas, Pilate is mentioned in writings outside the New Testament. It is possible, therefore, to obtain an independent assessment of his character. So whenever you're trying to figure out what's going on, which I often did as, as a reporter and, and as a blogger, what you do is you look for as many sources of information as you can find. And, and when you get a report, an allegation, you try to match it up with other sources of information to see if it rings, rings true. In the Gospels, Pilate is shown to be mild and good-natured. The picture that emerges from the accounts of Philo and Josephus is entirely different. Pilate is cruel, rapacious, and corrupt. Pilate was responsible for many unjust executions and was finally dismissed from office for carrying out a senseless massacre. The New Testament itself contains a hint of this in its reference to the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So that's Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Yet the picture given in the Brabus incident is of a man who, at the worst, can be accused of weakness, a well-meaning person anxious to avoid injustice, reluctant to shed blood, but easily intimidated by a hostile mob. But even if Pilate had been an honest, conscientious official, the role given to him in the Brabba story does not make sense. Why is he so unaware of the political implications of the title King of the Jews? But he actually presents Jesus to the crowd as their king. Why is he helpless in face of the crowd's determination to bring about Jesus' death? If he is really convinced of Jesus' innocence, there is nothing to stop him from setting him free. The Passover privilege itself is another dubious element in the story. There is no evidence in any other source that such a privilege existed. And it is inherently unlikely that the Jews of all the peoples of the empire had been granted the unique privilege of freeing a prisoner accused of sedition against Rome. It would be hardly be possible for a Roman governor to keep an unruly province in order if troublemakers could be released three times a year at the whim of the very crowd from which sedition could be most expected. Scholars nowadays are almost unanimous in regarding the Passover privilege as fictional. The general aim 
of the Barabbas story, so far as it concerns Pilate, is to increase the guilt of the Jews by exonerating the Romans. Although the final decision to execute Jesus was Pilate's, and the actual sentence and method of execution were Roman, the authors of the Gospels managed to show that the Romans were not really responsible. The governor's hand was forced both by the Passover privilege and by the attitude of the Jewish crowd. All the Pilate could do was to wash his hands and bow to the inevitable. However, when one examines the mechanics of the story, one becomes aware of a kind of optical illusion. There is no real reason given for Pilate's helplessness. He may widen our inquiry at this point and ask the question, what is the role of the Romans in the Gospels, or rather, where are the Romans in the Gospels? The answer is that they are scarcely mentioned. Anyone familiar with Jewish history around the time of Jesus must find this very puzzling. The overriding political fact of the period was the Roman occupation of Judea, where the last remnant of political independence had ceased only very recently, in uh, year six of the Common Era, when Jesus was about 12 years old. Yet, in the Gospels, the Roman occupation is treated as a matter of no interest or importance. It is as if someone were to write about France in the years 1940 to 45, without mentioning that it was under the occupation of Nazi Germany. And to the Jews, as to the French, national liberty was not just a matter of politics, it was also of great spiritual significance. In the whole of the four Gospels, the word Romans occurs only once, in John 11, verse 48. This is an extraordinary fact which requires explanation, like the dog which did not bark in the Sherlock Holmes story. The absence of the Romans is of the utmost significance. Twice only is some role assigned to Roman characters. The first occasion concerns Pilate in the story we have been considering. The other occasion concerns the Roman centurion who observes Jesus on the cross and says, Truly this man was the Son of God. His conduct being contrasted with that of the Jews who are represented as reviling Jesus on the cross. Both occasions are strongly favorable to the Romans. Pilate and the centurion are represented as sensitive to Jesus' divine status and as pitying his sufferings. In contrast with the Jews, were represented as blind to his divinity and as hounding him to his death. It seems then that the Gospels are not only anti-Jewish but also pro-Roman, both in the sense of ignoring and omitting everything which might put the Romans in an unfavorable light, for example, the domination of Judea, their idolatry, their rapacity, their cruelty, and also in the sense of representing them as spiritually superior to the Jews. Why are the Gospels hostile to the Jews and favorable to the Romans? To answer this question, we must investigate the historical background of the Gospels, the history of the period in which Jesus lived, and also of the period later one, in which the Gospels were written. It will be necessary to go into the political history of the Jews, and particularly to bring into the foreground the shadowy figures of the Romans, who in the Gospels scarcely have walking on parts to play. It will be necessary to bring to life the various Jewish sects and factions whose labels are hardly differentiated in the Gospels, or being united in their malevolence against Jesus. And then it will be necessary to look closely at the people who wrote the Gospels to determine why they wrote as they did, why their standpoint was so anti-Jewish and pro-Roman. Once we have done this, we can approach the whole story with more understanding and hope to appreciate the true significance of Jesus and his movement. In particular, we shall be able to offer a solution to the problems of the Barabbas episode in which all the focal difficulties of the gospel story are encapsulated. And then, chapter 2, How the Romans Came.
And uh, Otto Pohl writes in the chat, the theology of Christianity requires the killing of Jesus to atone for the sins of believers. So it is not possible for the Romans to not kill him. Have I watched The Passion of the Christ? Yes, I have. I, I thought it was like two hours of torture porn. Not one of my favorite movies. And Otto Paul says, the New Testament never struck me as being pro-Roman or anti-Jewish, but rather neutral, guarding the political conflict between the two. The Roman occupation to the Jews was a desecration of the Holy Land of the one true God by a nation of cruel and evil idolaters. It was a mockery of 2,000 years of Jewish history dedicated to the celebration of liberty and the refusal to accept enslavement that the people of God should be deprived of their autonomy was a horror and a mystery, which could be understood only as a preliminary to a new drama of liberation, greater even than the exodus from the slavery of Egypt, the return from Babylon, or the expulsion of the Greek imperialists 200 years before. Jesus, however, is portrayed in the Gospels as oblivious to the occupation never appears to question the right of the Romans to dominate Palestine with their troops, to bleed the country for their exorbitant tribute, and to massacre and crucify whenever their power was challenged. On only one occasion, according to the Gospels, did Jesus deign to consider the problem posed by the occupation. This was when the Pharisees and the Herodians, a strange combination as we shall see, asked him, is it lawful to give a tribute unto Caesar or not? Jesus' reply, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's, has been variously interpreted. For the present, we simply note that this single incident is a very inadequate representation of the enormous fact of the Roman occupation. The reasons for the suppression in the Gospels of reference to the Romans will be discussed later in the context of the political situation at the time of the composition of the Gospels. It is important at this stage to make the effort to visualize the situation as it really was, to realize that in Jesus' lifetime, Palestine was not a settled Roman province such as Gaul or Greece. That the Jews were far from reconciled to Roman rule and that there were several serious risings aimed at throwing the Romans out. How did the Romans come to be in Palestine? How did they first enter the country? What were the stages by which they tightened their hold on the Jewish nation and incorporated it into their empire? The Jews were able to trace back their history further than any other nation in the Roman world except the Egyptians. They had lost their independence many times before, but had always managed to recover it. Despite the desperate position as a small nation in a world of warring empires, the Jews saw themselves as essentially a free, self-governing people, not as a client state compelled to submit to one or other of the power blocks. Yet, in fact, it had been a long time since they were a powerful, sovereign state secure within its own boundaries not indeed since the days of David and Solomon, about 1,000 before the Common Era. Ever since then, the Jews had been ground between the millstones of great powers, whose armies passed to and fro across their land. In 722 before the Common Era, Assyria came and took away into exile a large portion of their people, the lost ten tribes of Israel. Those who were left became known as the Jews after the tribe of Judah, the largest remaining tribe. Later, even these were exiled from their land and taken away to Babylon. When the mild rule of the Persian Empire supervened, they were allowed to go back and set up their state again, 516 BCE. Here, under Ezra and his successors, a republican theocracy was set up governed by the law of Moses as administered by scribes and priests. The Persian Empire was overthrown by the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Alexander conquered Palestine in 332 BC 
but treated the Jews with some respect, careful not to disturb their constitution. After Alexander's death, the empire was divided between his successors, who were frequently at war with each other. At first, the Jews were under the Ptolemics, Ptolemies, who ruled from Egypt and were a tolerant dynasty. But later, they came under the more oppressive rule of the Seleucids, who ruled from Syria. As one of those, the mad Antiochus Epiphanes. My, my dad was always talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. That's how you say it in English. So I grew up as a little boy, I'd say Antiochus Epiphanes, abomination of desolation, who goaded the Jews into rebellion by trying to force them to give up Judaism and adopt the Hellenistic way of life, including the worship of himself as a god. The Jews found a leader, Judas Maccabeus, who in a series of battles drove the armies of the Syrian Greek dynasty out of Palestine in 160 BCE, set up the beginnings of an independent Jewish state. The degree of independence achieved was greater than the Jews had enjoyed for the previous 500 years. How many names of God is there in Judaism? I mean, at least 70. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And Otto says Jesus had to be killed according to Christian theology. That was why he was born. There is no other option than execution if you are a believer. And Dan Allison says, mankind killed Christ, why sweat the details? Uh, look forward, do I believe the Talmud when it says Nero converted to Judaism? I, uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to read more about it. I, I think it's probably a, a story, a fanciful story rather than a historical fact. And talking about uh, boiling an excrement. Uh, so does the Talmud talk about Jesus? That's a question that scholars dispute because, of course, there are many people uh, essentially named Joshua in, in the Talmud. Jesus is just an Aramaic translation of Joshua. But certainly in both Christian writings about Jews and Jewish writings about Christians, there are a lot of uh, horrible things said in both directions. Though from what I understand, the only uh, genocidal writings are from the Christian side regarding Jews. This independence, however, could not last. It was a result of the chaos and power vacuum that followed at the death of Alexander, which was finally resolved by the rise to the supreme power of the Romans. For a while, even after the Romans achieved mastery over every other power in the area, Jews were able to maintain a limited, uneasy independence. The Romans were still engaged in fighting each other for control of their conquests, but once these internal disputes were settled by the establishment of the imperial dynasty of Augustus, Jewish independence was doomed. Ironically, the first appearance of the Romans on the scene of Jewish history was in the guise of friends. Judas Maccabeus, after expelling the Syrian Greeks, made a treaty of friendship with Rome in 160 BCE. Rome at this time was already greatly feared by the Seleucid rulers of Syria, and the effect of the treaty was to protect the Jews from further invasion by the Greeks. However, it is a commonplace of history that a small power invokes the protection of a larger power at its peril. The Jews escaped from the Greeks only to enter the sphere of influence of the Romans. This did not become apparent for quite a long time, however, and a useful interlude was gained in which Jewish morale had an opportunity to revive.
There was an outbreak of dissension within the Jewish royal family that was the immediate cause of direct Roman intervention in Jewish affairs. This royal dynasty, the Hasmoneans, were the descendants of the Maccabean brothers, led by Judas, who had expelled the Syrian Greeks. The name Hasmoneans being derived from Judas's great grandfather, Hasmon. The early Hasmoneans had been actuated by religious ideals and were supported by the religious party of the Hasidim, later called Pharisees, who had first put them in power. However, when they adopted secular aims and assumed the title of king, the Pharisees denounced them, and relations between the two groups became bitterly antagonistic. There was a brief period between 76 BCE and 67, during which Queen Alexandra returned to the early Hasmonean ideal and ruled in harmony with the Pharisees. But after her death, the two sons, Aristobulus and Hyrcanus, engaged in a squabble for the succession. And it was this that led to Roman intervention in the shape of the army of Pompey the Great. Pompey at this time was fighting against Mithridates, king of Pontus, Asia Minor. One of his officers, called Scorus, was stationed at Damascus and heard about the civil war in Palestine between the two Hasmonean brothers, Aristobulus and Hyrcanus. Scorus sent a prophet and offered to intervene. Both brothers were prepared to pay in the sum of 400 talents, about $1,600 for his support. Scorus decided he was more likely to get his money from Aristobulus whom he then helped by sending a threatening message to Hyrcanus' ally, the Arab king Harith, who decamped at once. Another officer of Pompey's, Gabinus, also extracted huge bribes from Aristobulus. The Roman vulture had arrived, and this was the end of Jewish independence. From now on, the Romans were aware that there were rich pickings to be had in Palestine. The other Hasmonean brother, Hyrcanus, had an extraordinarily intelligent minister named Antipater, who understood the art of doing business with the Romans. Antipater was an Arab, an Edomite by birth, but practiced Judaism because he came from a region which had been conquered and forcibly converted to Judaism. When Pompey himself came south to Syria after defeating Mithridates, the cunning diplomacy of Antipater won him over to the support of Hyrcanus. Aristobulus's bribes had been spent for nothing, and Aristobulus now made the mistake of showing fight to Pompey. Aristobulus shot himself into Jerusalem and defied the Romans. I wonder if there's any mention on Twitter of that earthquake that we just, uh, we just felt here in LA. Yes, okay. So as I started... <laughs> So looking at Twitter, when you felt the earthquake in Los Angeles, but you also need sleep. Veronica, I can always count on Twitter to verify earthquakes. Yeah, there's an earthquake in Beverly Hills. My entire bed lurched and jolted me awake. I need my post-Oscar sleep. Damn earthquake. Found the culprit. Okay. Centered in West Hollywood. And uh, really just at 1.9. Nice little jolt. A jolty jolt, a sharp jolt here at the epicenter. Feeling it in Culver City, Westwood, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, La Brea, Miracle Mile. Okay, it was located 14 miles southeast of Los Angeles at 1.51 a.m., Ah, 3.3 on the Richter scale. <laughs> when, when the earthquake wakes you up, but you have to be up in a few hours. Oh yeah, I've got an iPhone that's supposed to have a, an, an earthquake detector, but uh, it didn't, didn't go off. I've been here for two years and I'm still not used to many, uh, many earthquakes. Earthquake workers up heard a loud crack, then a loud rumbling for a second before it passed the house. Didn't help that I was watching X-Files when it happened. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, apparently about 3.3 on the Richter scale. So I think that the biggest earthquake I've experienced is about uh, 5.5, 5.8. A text message. Does the house keep creaking? I'm trying to fall asleep and I just keep hearing things. Okay. So, yeah, that was a real earthquake that we felt just as I started streaming. Yeah, it's shake, shook here. You can rewatch the stream. You can see it uh, rumble through. So, I'm just starting the stream. Wow, you get, Otto says we get so many earthquakes here in Kurdistan. I don't bother getting up unless they hit seven or more. Yeah, you're going to get up if it hits seven. Judas bought futures contracts with his 30 pieces of silver. Okay, now we'll sit here and wait for the uh, Yellowstone super volcano to blow. Okay, that was that was quite a little earthquake just as I was starting this stream about half an hour ago. So you have to rewatch it rumble through. When Pompey himself came south to Syria after defeating Mithridates, the cutting diplomacy of Antipater won him over the support of Hyrcanus. Aristobulus now made the mistake of showing fight to Pompey. Aristobulus shut himself into Jerusalem, defied the Romans. Pompey had a well-trained army of 10 legions, 50,000 men, one of the most formidable armies ever seen in the region. With typical Roman methodical skill, he besieged and took Jerusalem. To the horror of the Jews, the Roman soldiers entered the temple where only priests were allowed to set foot. The priests were actually performing sacrifices at the time and refused to interrupt the service, whereupon the Roman soldiers cut them down. Then Pompey himself, full of curiosity, entered the Holy of Holies, the Kadosh Kadoshim, that most sacred place where only the high priest could go, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. He found no image there and so confirmed the Jewish claim they worshipped an invisible god. Rumors spread by the Alexandrian Greeks were to the effect that the Holy of Holies contained the image of an ass. Pompey did not rob the temple of its treasures. The very fact that a Gentile could enter the Holy of Holies with impunity was a terrible blow to the Jews. The Hasbunian dream of independence had now ended. The whole incident was a kind of rehearsal in miniature for the tragic drama the Jewish war against Rome 133 years later when the temple was razed to the ground. The massacres of that war were to make the 12,000 Jews killed by Pompey's army seem a mere handful in comparison. The upshot of Pompey's defeat of Aristobulus was not the installation of Hyrcanus as king, but the appointment of the subtle Antipater as governor with Hyrcanus relegated to the position of high priest, as Pompey inaugurated the Roman policy of ruling Palestine through native quislings, were made responsible for collecting the tribute in money and corn, which was the ultimate motive for Rome's policy of conquest. Antipater now became the Romans' chief ally in Palestine. He helped the rapacious officers in Scorus and Gabinus to extort huge sums as protection money from Harith, king of Nabataka, and Ptolemy, king of Egypt. Whenever the Jews attempted to rebel against the Roman rule, Antipater acted on the side of Rome. When the Jews of Galilee, for example, encouraged by a heavy Roman defeat in Parthia, rose up in revolt, Antipater helped Cassius, the friend of Brutus, to crush them. He also made Many influential friends among the Romans, including a young man named Mark Antony. At that time, beginning his career as a campaigner in the Middle East. So Rome reached its zenith. Uh, and uh, about, about year 50, 60 of the Common Era. And it never, ever got any bigger after about year 70 after their first 
uh, war with the Jews. Well, first major war with the Jews, the, the destruction of the temple. And then Rome started going into decline after a second major war with the Jews about uh, 50 years after the destruction of the temple. After the death of Pompey, Antipater attached himself to the new star Julius Caesar and was of immense help to him in his campaigns in Egypt. In gratitude, Caesar gave Antipater the Roman title of proc procurator, as well as making him a full Roman citizen with exemption from taxes. Julius Caesar, like most Roman commanders, had a certain liking and respect for the Jews. In this, he resembled his Greek counterpart, Alexander the Great. But even Caesar did not forget the purpose of Roman imperialism in Palestine. He enacted that one quarter of the crop every year, except the seventh, which was a fallow year by Jewish law, should be paid to Rome as tribute. This may seem a heavy enough tribute, but it was regarded as a relief by the Jews after years of depredation since Pompey's conquest. Corrupt officers like Scorus had enriched themselves. The temple, whose treasures were spared by Pompey, was robbed in 53 BCE by Crassus of 10,000 talents of gold, about $40 million, and taxes of irregular extent were levied and farmed out for collection to tax farmers or publicans, who, backed by the power of the Roman legions, used every cruelty to ensure payment. Caesar forbade tax farming and safeguarded the contributions to the temple, which were sent regularly by Jewish communities from Spain to Babylonia. Caesar also gave his protection to Jewish citizens and uh, gave them rights and freedom of worship throughout the Roman world. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, he was mourned by all the Jews of the empire. If subsequent Roman rulers had been like him, there would have been no Jewish war. Incidentally, one of the marks of favor shown by Caesar to the Jews was that Hyrcanus, the high priest, and all Jewish ambassadors were granted free seats at Roman gladiatorial combats and wild beast shows. The Jews of Palestine formed only part of the Jewish people. There are about 3 million Jews in Palestine and more than 3 million outside. And in the second big war with Rome, apparently about 1 million Jews in Palestine died. The Jews had belonged to so many empires that the centrifugal forces of empire building had flung them across the whole known world. There was even a Jewish settlement in India dating from 175 BCE, when Alexander's Indian conquest was still attached to Hellenism. Jewish settlements in North Africa and Spain had followed in the wake of the Carthaginian Empire. The Jews were adventurous traders and were also used by successive empires as soldiers. In Alexandria, the great Hellenistic city of Egypt, the Jewish community numbered about 500,000. The large and prosperous community of Babylon, which enjoyed virtual self-government under the Parthians data from the Babylonian and Persian empires. But the Jews of the diaspora, or dispersion as it was called, retained their identity because of their distinctive religion. Moreover, frequent pilgrimages to Jerusalem for the major festivals meant that contact with the homeland was preserved. After the death of Caesar in 44 BCE, the Jews of Palestine soon had good reason to mourn for Cassius, who, unlike Brutus, was not reluctant to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any direction immediately demanded tribute of 700 talents, about $3 million. Antipater was ordered to collect this sum. When some of the Jews showed reluctance to pay, Cassius sold the entire population of four towns into slavery. As a result, Antipater was assassinated by poison and his role passed to his son Herod, afterwards called the Great. 
Herod was as cunning and resolute as his father. His extraordinary talents throughout his career were directed towards making the Jewish kingdom into an integral part of the Roman Empire. He was intelligent enough to realize that this aim could not be achieved by suppressing Judaism or by destroying the distinctive Jewish culture. He therefore played up, for all he was worth, the Jewish claims for special consideration as the bearers of a faith of awesome antiquity and purity. He rebuilt the Jewish temple at such lavish expense that it was admired even by the Greeks as one of the wonders of the world. Herod was an efficient administrator, and his astute manipulation of trade relations with Arabia brought great profit to his country. Okay, just hoping there'll be no more earthquakes this morning. Despite all this, however, Herod failed completely to reconcile the Jewish people to membership of the Roman Empire. So when you're sitting down, it's important to keep your feet on the ground. Because if you just let your feet dangle, then the weight of your body is going to sag and pull on your spine. But when you have your feet flat on the ground, then it's easier to send direction up your spine. And you can have upward direction, you can have width, and you can have length. And you can be as elegant as me. Yes, there was an earthquake about uh, 45 minutes ago. So right at the beginning of this video. So when I stop and pause it, you can watch it from the beginning. Cleopatra was the Yoko Ono of the classical world. <laughs> Did King David even exist? I have no idea. I believe so, of course, but uh, yeah, just as I was starting my stream, the Lord spake and sent an earthquake. It, uh, it rattled me. Cleopatra was known for her fellatio skills. Despite all this, Herod failed completely to reconcile the Jewish people to membership of the Roman Empire. Although outwardly successful, his personal life became more and more gloomy, he became isolated from his people, and he died a friendless tyrant. Also, he didn't keep his feet flat on the ground, so his body weight would just sag on his uh, skeletal structure. He didn't practice the Alexander technique. The moment his death was announced, the Jews rose in rebellion against their Roman overlords. The main reason for Herod's failure to accomplish his aim was that, as a foreigner, he did not understand the Jewish temper and self-image. Herod, like his father Antipater, was very ambitious, but his horizon was limited by the Roman Empire. The height of his ambition was to cut a great figure on the imperial scene, to hobnob with men like Antony and Augustus on equal or almost equal terms. He had no real conception of the Jewish ambition. With their hopes fixed on the coming of the Messiah, the Jews were unimpressed by all Herod's glory, not inspired by his vision of the Jewish role within the Roman Empire. I just realized I got my lighting all wrong. Man, I'm sorry I didn't didn't provide you with the high quality lighting and the high quality technical productions that you expect from the Luke Ford show. Herod's way was certainly the way of common sense. The other way led to head-on conflict with Rome, to disestablishment and exile. Remember one of the longest words I learned as a kid was anti-disestablishmentarianism. So the Jews were the opposite of anti-disestablishmentarianism. But the protest against the peace of Rome was part of the Jewish mission. They had not crossed the Red Sea, spent 40 years in the desert, survived the empires of Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, 
and Greece just to finish up as contented contributors to Roman culture. Herod's position was that of a client king. This carried certain privileges for client kingdoms, unlike subject provinces, did not have to pay taxes direct to Rome or to undergo military service in the Roman army. Nevertheless, Palestine, like the other client kingdoms of the Middle East, such as Armenia, Cappadocia, Galatia, and Commagene, were thoroughly part of the Roman Empire. The main tasks of a client king were to keep his kingdom in good order and loyal to Rome and to repulse any attacks from Rome's enemies on the borders of the empire. Herod could not make any important decision, even involving his own family, without permission from the emperor. He was liable to be summoned to Rome to give an account of his actions or to answer charges made against him. He could be deposed at any time if he proved incompetent or unreliable. How do I confuse you with plastic on my nose and waving a cigar? I... I use a nose dilator, but if you want me. Okay. I, I took my nose dilator out to give you the high quality productions that you expect from Luke Ford. But, uh, but now you want me to put the nose dilator in, so the nose dilator's in, mate. Who's been beating Luke? Where well, you should see the other guys. You'd see what would what happened to him. Okay, let's get back to work. I got my nose dilator in. I got my breathe right strip on my nose. Ah, oh. mm, I'm getting such incredible nasal airflow right now. You wouldn't believe it. Just unbelievable. Okay. Those, those nose dilators are about $5 each. Yeah, you should see what happened to Jussie Smollett. But I got my feet on the ground, and I'm reaching for the stars. Isn't that what Casey Kasem used to finish his shows? Keep your feet on the ground and reach for the stars. Casey Kasem, keep your feet on the ground. Okay, let's get this Casey Kasem quote. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Or keep your feet flat on the ground so that you can then ascend upward direction through your musculature. You guys keeping your feet flat on the ground and sending upward direction. Yeah, nasal airflow is essential for good sleep. This is what keeps Luke sharp. Absolutely. Okay, let's get back to the work here. However, under Herod's regime, the Jews of Palestine were spared the more obvious humiliations of Roman rule. No Roman armies overran the country as in the days of Pompey or Cassius, demanding tribute and selling off defaulters into slavery. Herod had his own army officered by Jews. When the Roman statesman Agrippa came to Palestine in 15 BCE, he came out with an army, but as a visitor. Herod's friend and showed his appreciation of Herod's welcome by generous banquets and a munificent offering to the temple. It was, on the surface at any rate, a regime of coexistence. While Herod ruthlessly suppressed any manifestations of Jewish nationalism, which had an anti-Roman tendency, keep hope alive, guys. Keep, keep the flame of hope alive this morning. Okay. He encouraged non-political manifestations of the Jewish spirit, such as the legal studies of the Pharisees and the monastic asceticism of the Essenes. Yet at the same time, the process of Romanization was going quietly on. Herod rebuilt the Jewish temple, but he also built a temple to the divine Augustus. Divine, in quotes. He sent his sons to Rome to be educated. And he introduced the action games in the Greco-Roman style, with chariot races, theatrical performances, athletic events, and gladiatorial contests to the death. The Pharisees, after initial opposition to Herod for his illegal execution of the Galilean patriot Ezekias in the days when Herod's father Antipater was still alive, 
and after suffering martyrdom at his hands when he first seized the throne, were won over for a time by his astute policies. But the Pharisees began to realize the direction Palestine was heading, and Herod's reign ended as it began with the Pharisees opposed to his Romanizing policies. The Sadducees, on the other hand, who had originally been Herod's bitterest opponents because of their loyalty to the priest kings of the Hasmonean house, ceased to oppose him. There were no Hasmoneans left. Herod had exterminated them all. The high priest was now always a creature of Herod's who appointed and dismissed high priests at will. And since the high priest was always the center of the Sadducees' religious life, whoever managed to control him would also control the Sadducees. They became docile collaborators with Herod and with the Romans. When Herod died after a pitiable old age disfigured by madness and murder, the Jews began to face the realities of Roman power. No longer sheltered by Herod's formidable influence with the Roman leaders, they learned how far Herod had delivered them into Roman hands. It was in the bitter conditions of this awakening that Jesus spent his childhood. Now 52 minutes since the earthquake. Chapter 3, The Roman Administration. I'm reading from a Chaim Maccabee book, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and Jewish Resistance. And this book came out October 1, 1980. Keep your head on the ground and your feet in the air. Try this trick and spin it. Yeah. Okay, let's keep rocking and rolling. After the death of Herod in 4 BCE, there was no one to continue his role of client king, a role which had depended entirely on his personal qualities and his ability to form friendships with the Roman overlords. In the insane suspicions of his last days, Herod had murdered his abler sons, and nominated as his successor his son Achilles, a man who inherited his father's cruelty, but not his cunning. This appointment, however, had to be ratified by the Emperor Augustus, for no client king could automatically choose his successor. Before Achilles could travel to Rome to receive Augustus' approval, he was faced by a rebellion of the Pharisees, or the teachers of the law, who had been in conflict with Herod just before his death. He dealt with the matter summarily, by massacring about 3,000 of their followers. Archelaus then set off for Rome, followed by his brother Herod Antipas, who hoped to persuade Augustus to make him king of the Jews instead. The Romans now closed in, with Archelaus and Antipas sailing to Italy. Roman troops under Sabinus were taking possession of Jerusalem. Sabinus was under the authority of Varus, the Roman legate of Syria, who had assured Archelaus that the Romans would hold their hand until his return from Rome. But Sabinus, in the disorder following the death of Herod, sensed that there were pickings to be had. He knew there were treasures in Herod's palace in Jerusalem and even greater treasures in the temple. The empire at this time was not yet as tightly controlled as it later became. The corruption and oppression of Roman officials had reached such proportions during the Republic that there was a real danger of killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. Even the richest provinces of the empire, Syria and Egypt, were nearing bankruptcy. Augustus had no intention of allowing anyone to make a personal fortune except himself. But his campaign against corruption had not reached Palestine, which, throughout the lifetime of Jesus, was ruled by rapacious officials who regarded their position as a heaven-sent opportunity to line their pockets by every kind of extortion. Sabinus entered Herod's palace and settled there with his 5,000 heavily armed Roman soldiers and about 5,000 auxiliary troops of other nations. Jerusalem at the time was crowded with Jewish pilgrims who had come to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. Their dismay and horror can be imagined. For 37 years during the reign of Herod, 
the holy city and indeed the whole of Palestine had been free from Roman troops. Now these ironclad monsters were back, defiling the city with their idolatrous standards ready to rob and slaughter as in the days of Pompey and Scorus. Palace of Herod joined the temple itself and it was clear that Sabinus, after completing his survey of Herod's treasures, would turn his attention to robbing the temple. Memories were stirred of the time, 53 BCE, when the infamous Crassus had robbed the temple treasury to pay for his campaign against Parthia. People of Jerusalem, augmented by the pilgrims, rose in a body against Sabinus. The battle was won by the Romans with some difficulty and in the fighting part of the temple was set alight. Sabinus took the opportunity to do just what was feared. He plundered the temple. Roman soldiers carried off huge sums. Sabinus himself appropriated 400 talents, about six, about $1,600,000. The Jews, however, continued to press Sabinus hard, and he was besieged in Herod's palace. News of what was happening in Jerusalem spread throughout the country, and the Jews began to take to arms in various regions, including Galilee, the birthplace of Jesus. This was the first appearance of the famous anti-Roman guerrilla fighter Judas of Galilee, the son of the patriot Ezekias Hezekiah. His execution at the hands of Herod incurred the indignation of the Pharisees. Sabinus was now in some danger and he wrote to his superior officer Varus for help. Varus, though he may have been annoyed at Sabinus's buccaneering exploits could not let a Roman legion be overwhelmed. He set off with two more legions together with a large number of auxiliaries to the relief of the Roman forces in Jerusalem. Having accomplished this, he also subdued the armed bands in the countryside. Now the Jews began to learn what it meant to rebel against Rome. Varus introduced into Palestine a form of punishment which was to become a familiar feature of the landscape. He crucified 2,000 of the captured rebels. Jesus at this time was about two years old. Crucifixion is the most barbarous form of punishment ever invented. The exquisite cruelty lay in the long drawn accumulative agonies. Some victims lasted for as long as three days. The cross was usually T-shaped and the victim's feet did not touch the ground. It was considered a less cruel method if the victim's hands and feet were pierced with nails as this led to a quicker death. When cords were used, the feet were not fastened at all, so that the weight of the body was borne by the outstretched arms. This position, which soon produced complete immobility and helplessness, led to gradually increasing constriction and agonizing pain. The victim was always naked, and his suffering was increased by the scourging which preceded crucifixion. This was so severe that his flesh would hang in strips. Crucifixion was originally not a punishment, but a form of human sacrifice used in fertility cults because a slow dying victim was held to produce more beneficial effects on the crop. It was used particularly in the cult of Tammuz, the dying and resurrected god of the Lebanon and Phoenicia. Later, crucifixion was used merely as a form of execution especially when the criminal was considered deserving of the utmost contempt and humiliation. The Carthaginians, who were Phoenician in origin, used crucifixion extensively, and it was from them that the Romans derived this form of execution. According to Roman law, crucifixion was confined to slaves or to those who had committed abominable crimes. In Palestine, the Romans used crucifixion as a deterrent against rebelliousness. They crucified thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Jews during the period of their occupation. The cross became as much a symbol of Roman oppression as nowadays the gas chamber is a symbol of German Nazi oppression. It is necessary to stress this because of the determined efforts in the Gospels to associate the guilt of the cross with the Jews rather than with the Romans, which is comparable to branding the Jewish victims of the German gas chambers with the guilt of using gas chambers instead of suffering from them. To the Jews, crucifixion was a particularly loathsome and horrifying form of inhumanity. It was outlawed in Jewish law to such an extent that it was forbidden even to crucify a dead body. See Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. That the Romans were crucifiers was sufficient to condemn them as savages. The Gospels, however, which condemned the Pharisees, the chief victims, 
the Roman policy of crucifixion for various alleged crimes of hypocrisy and complacency, nowhere condemn the Romans for the time of crucifixion or indeed for anything else. Varus's crucifixion of 2,000 Jews in the very year of Herod's death showed the Jews with sickening plainness the kind of brutal treatment to which they were now exposed. In one year they had seen their holy places defiled and robbed, and the best men of their nation, who had risen to defend the shrine, contemptuously tortured to death. It is no wonder that these events, with their attendant despair, gave a great impetus to apocalyptic dreams of God's salvation. Such things could only happen, many devout Jews reasoned, in the throes of the last days. From this time, messianic movements of every kind flourished. One of these was the movement of John the Baptist, and another was that of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance by Chaim Maccabee is definitely worth a read, worth a purchase. The immediate outcome of the events of the year of Herod's death was a return to something like the conditions prevailing during Herod's lifetime. Augustus decided after long deliberations in Rome to confirm Herod's will and make Archelaus ruler of Judea and Samaria, comprising about half of Herod's realm. The rest of Palestine was shared between Herod's other two surviving sons, Herod Antipas and Philip. Galilee, where Jesus was living, came under the rule of Herod Antipas. Archelaus was not given the title of king, however, as his father had wished, he was put on probation. If he proved a good ruler, he would eventually become king. Meanwhile, he had to be content with the title Ethnarch. Always wanted to be an Ethnarch. Augustus had thus decided not to subject Palestine to direct Roman rule, but to continue with the system of client princedoms. However, the dependence of the Jews on Rome, which had been disguised by the flamboyance of Herod's personality, was now plain for everyone to see. The Jewish princes had attended on Augustus, cap in hand, to supplicate for confirmation in their rule, and in their absence, Roman troops had given the Jewish people a bitter foretaste of what direct Roman rule would be like. Direct rule was not long in coming. Archelaus did not pass his probation and never became king. After 10 years, Augustus became dissatisfied with him and dismissed him to banishment in Vienna. His princedom now came under direct Roman rule for the first time since the days of Pompeii. Judea and Samaria were declared to be part of the Roman province of Syria, and a second-class Roman official called a procurator was appointed to be the ruler of the land of David and Solomon. The humiliation of the people of God was now complete. In Galilee, where Herod Antipas still retained his client princedom with some shreds of sovereignty remained, but Herod Antipas was a very minor figure compared with his father and was clearly nothing more than a Roman official himself. In his style of life, too, he was more of a Roman than a Jew. It is his entourage which is called in the Gospels the Herodians. The Jews of Galilee disliked and despised him. They were famous for their fierce Jewish patriotism, and the events in Judea affected them deeply. Jerusalem was for them their capital and holy city, and that it was now under direct Roman rule was as much a blow to them as to the Jews of Judaica, or Judea. It is quite understandable. The leader of the anti-Roman movement, which now gathered strength, was a Galilean Judas of Galilee. Even though Galilee itself was not under direct rule, Jesus grew up in an atmosphere more patriotic and anti-Roman than if he'd been born in Jerusalem itself. The title procurator was that of a fiscal rather than a military or political official. The title means something like chief tax inspector. Oh yeah, life of Brian. <laughs> G'day, Colin. Good to see you, mate. Good to see the, the, the people's Judean front. 
is in the house. Yeah, Andy Nowicki for governor of Palestine. <laughs> the chief task of the pro procurator then was to collect taxes from Judea. The Jews, of course, had been forced to pay taxes under their own kings, but the situation was now very different. Herod, despite his huge expenditure, had improved the country's agriculture, and through his astute policy of cornering the rich trade in spices from Arabia, had doubled the revenue of his kingdom, and was even able in some years to remit his subjects', subjects taxes altogether. The Arabian trade now went straight to Rome and did nothing to ease the Jewish taxpayers' burden. Procurators had little interest in schemes of economic betterment for the country. They knew that their term of office was likely to be short and they would probably never again have such an opportunity to enrich themselves by dipping their hands into the imperial till. The next emperor, Tiberius, had a policy of keeping such officials in office for longer periods. On the principle, as he said, that gorged horse flies suck less blood than fresh ones. His saying, which is usually quoted to show Tiberius's humanitarian concern for the subjects of Rome, also shows his cynical acceptance of the fact that Roman governors were out for their own enrichment. First years of direct rule in Judea are unfortunately poorly documented. We do know, however, that there were four procurators in the space of 20 years, meaning from 6 of the common era to 20 year 26. The names were Caponius, Marcus Ambibulus, Ennius Rufus, and Biggus Dicus. No, just making that out. Valerius Gratus. On Tiberius's principle, such frequently changing officials must have been horseflies of continually ungorged appetite. We know from the Roman historian Tacitus that the Jews sent a delegation to Rome during this period to protest about their sufferings from overtaxation. Okay, what kind of link here is uh, Colin posting? Oh, Pontius Pilate. His Scottish origins. Wow, that's interesting. Pontius Pilate was born in Scotland. Didn't know that. We know also that the infamous system of tax farming, which had been abolished by Julius Caesar, was reinstituted as soon as the Romans moved in. This amounted to handing over the collection of taxes to private contractors who were little better than gangsters, whose profit on the deal depended on collecting as much as possible over and above the face value of the taxes. Details of the activities of these tax farmers called in the New Testament publicans can be found in the writings of Philo. They hired gangs of ruffians who demanded such huge sums that their victims often fled in despair. When this happened, the tax collectors tortured the fugitive's family on racks, wheels, and other appliances of torture to make them either disclose the whereabouts of the fugitive or make payment in his stead. Suicides were common to avoid this torture. If all else failed, the victim or his family were sold into slavery. The tax collectors could always call on the Roman army for support if necessary. The tax farming contracts were usually given to Roman citizens whose underlings were recruited from the worst elements of the country on whom they battened. These wretches who were prepared to join in the organized robbery of their own countrymen for the sake of a percentage of the loot were regarded as criminals by their compatriots. These are the publicans with whom Jesus consorted to reclaim them from sin. They were social outcasts. It was for good reason. It was the measure of Jesus' optimism and faith that he hoped to reclaim even these most abandoned of torturers and extortionists. It's not surprising that the appearance of the publicans was a signal for revolt. The first act of the new government was to institute a census of the inhabitants of Judea and Samaria. Okay, now I'm starting to get sleepy, and uh, I think I can go back to sleep now. So good chatting with you guys to be continued. I was reading from the Higher Maccabee book from 1980, Revolution in Judea, Jesus, and the Jewish Resistance. Stay frosty, my friends.